invited I invited uh, Melissa to come pray um, prophetically because I didn't know that I would be so emotional. So let's just say that God knew. And so she's going to read our scripture this morning. Um, you can turn to Matthew chapter 10. We're in verses 17. Mark, Mark chapter 10, right? Oh, Mark, Mark. Thank you. <laughs> Mark chapter 10. See, verse I'm a 17. mess, I'm Melissa. I'm a mess. <laughs> it's okay. Mark uh, chapter 10, verses 17 through 31. As Jesus started on his way, a man ran up to him and fell to his knees before him. Good teacher, he asked, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Why do you call me good? Jesus answered. No one is good except God alone. You know the commandments. You shall not murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not give false testimony. You shall not defraud and honor your father and mother. Teacher, he declared, all these I have done since I was a boy. Jesus looked at him and loved him. One thing you lack, he said. Go sell everything you have and give to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven. Then come follow me. At this, the man's face fell. He went away sad because he had great wealth. Jesus looked around and said to his disciples, how hard it is for the rich to enter the kingdom of God. The disciples were amazed at his words, but Jesus said again, children, how hard is it to enter the kingdom of God? It is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for someone who is rich to enter the kingdom of God. The disciples were even more amazed and said to each other, who then can be saved? Jesus looked at them and said, with man, this is impossible, but not with God. All things are possible with God. Then Peter spoke up, we left everything to follow you. Truly I tell you, Jesus replied, no one who has left home or brothers or sisters or mother or father or children or fields for me and the gospel will fail to receive a hundred times as much as in this present age. Homes, brothers, sisters, mothers, children, and fields along with persecutions and in the age of or age to come eternal life but many who are first will be last hmm. and the last first all right let's pray lord we um we bow before you this morning and open our hearts to the holy spirit to receive your word and we we know god that when we do that um that it makes us look and sound and act more and more like you and understand who you are. And so, God, we, we pray that uh, you would do what you've promised to meet us all individually exactly where we're at and to, uh, to guide us. And so, God, we just, at this moment, front load our yes to whatever it is that you're going to ask of us. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. <clears throat> Man, I... I tell you what, that, that last song, when you're praying for your kids, that's a, that's a good one. And I, I'm realizing now the, the connection of, of this sermon passage, uh, maybe even to that song and where you're praying for your kids that are, you know, struggling in different ways, or even when they're not, you still are, are praying for them. And, and if you don't have kids, um, you're part of a body of Christ. You're part of a church, which means you do. Like we speak into each other's lives and we're part of this communal thing that God weaves together to become his church. And so um, if you don't have kids you're praying for, you should be praying for the kids around you and for the grandkids and uh, of, of people around you. And, and for, for some of you, um, wandering kids or wandering grandkids is like the greatest heartbreak of your life. And so we continually place them before Jesus, and I, I think uh, this this passage offers us um, some answers to what do we do in in, in times like that. So um, before we go to this passage, I want to address some wrong theology that comes from this passage. So so sometimes in Scripture you'll find some some scriptures that are just thick with wrong beliefs and what wrong doctrine that, that flow out of it. This is one of those stories 
that has a, a lot of wrong thinking that comes out of this. And I, I call these, these wrong thinking, I call them incomplete views, because no one would believe them if they're just 100% false. So they all have some sort of truth to them, but they also fall short in some way. So I just labeled them incomplete views. So before uh, we go through the passage, I just want to address these uh, quickly to say these, these sound like they are right, but they're actually incomplete. So the first of the incomplete views, wealthy are excluded from God's kingdom. Jesus doesn't say here, that the rich are just out of luck. There's nothing that you can do about it. But Jesus does acknowledge the real life challenges that humans have not trusting in wealth. And and Jesus doesn't say that it's it's just kind of hard. Uh, Other scriptures tell us that, that things like sex, power, and money are demon-like forces that want to enslave us and have us worship them instead of God. That's why Jesus says rather bluntly in Matthew chapter 6, you can't serve both God and money. God and mammon is the word there, which is a deity. But it's an incomplete, incomplete view to say, well, that means all wealthy people are excluded from, from the kingdom. That's not true. And as we'll see, there's, there's a lot of biblical evidence to back that up. The second incomplete view is that wealthy, wealthy people can sneak in the back door of the kingdom if they just humble up a little bit. It's like, uh, you know, it's like they're kind of playing their money and they're saying, you know, I get to hold on to most of it if I just sort of kneel before God a little bit in this area. And so, so some people maybe not directly say, but have this belief that wealthy people can sneak in the back door of the kingdom. And so what ends up happening is we take scriptures like this and we look for ways to soften what Jesus is saying to cater to wealthy people. And I have to tell you, as a pastor, um, I understand that because ministry costs money. When people walk in off the street and they want help, um, we help them. That's that's what we do, and quite frequently, it's paying a bill for them or something like that, and so what we're doing costs money, and so it can be really difficult within the church to not have the, for wealthy people to not have the ear more than unwealthy people of the board or of pastors, And, and so what happens is sometimes people use this scripture to cater to wealthy people, but we can't do that uh, because Jesus' words here are very, very intentional, and so we'll go through that later. Uh, A third uh, incomplete view is that ministry that costs money is wrong. Ministry shouldn't require money, but the Bible reminds us over and over and over that, that people consistently give to support the work of God, the work of the apostles, the work of Jesus, the work of the church, missionary work, In Luke chapter 8, verse 3, this is talking about Jesus and his disciples specifically. It says, Joanna, the wife of Chusa, who was the manager of Herod's household, Susanna, and many others, helped to support them, this is Jesus and the disciples, out of their own means. These wealthy women supported the ministry of Jesus and the disciples out of their own means mean. So ministry costs money, and that's okay. We have to use discretion and wisdom, and we have to be good stewardship. We have to be good stewards of God's money, but we also are investing in places that God calls us to invest in, and we're doing it generously. I can remember a story when we were pastoring in Hawaii, and and we were uh, just a couple years into our church plant, we were dead broke. The church started with no people except for the family starting the church. And then uh, at some point, another family indicated interest in our church that we really didn't have. And so we started a Bible study. And so, but it was a whole bunch of poor people within the church who were giving. And so um, I went to go do this visit to a family who requested help. And they wanted help, uh, some pretty major help. So I thought, okay, this is worth going and having a conversation. I, I was following GPS into this neighborhood that was a hundred times nicer than our neighborhood. And I'm going, 
All right, maybe not a great start to someone, but there's real need here. And so I'm going down this road, and I'm thinking, maybe I have the wrong address. And sure enough, I got there. <clears throat> it's the right address. There's two cars in the driveway, nicer than my cars, a beautiful yard, a beautiful home, a satellite dish on top. I walked in, and I saw immaculate appliances, well, I mean, super, super nice couches. And I had to explain to these people that we couldn't help them because the money that I would be using to help them is coming from very, very poor people, single moms, homeless people, who were scraping and doing the best they can to get by and being generous. And so I said, the best way I can help you is to help you get rid of some of this stuff. So, ministry costs money, but we use wisdom and discretion. So it, it's false uh, to say that ministry that costs money is wrong. Another theology that comes out of this, this is the final one, um, is that everyone's required to take a vow of poverty to get into heaven. So, like, we have to all be monks that sell all of our possessions and go into the top of the mountains and build a monastery and never talk and never use money again. But, but that's not correct, and we see that all throughout the Bible. In the Old Testament, we have Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and many others who are considered to be very wealthy men who, who were doing amazing stuff for the Lord and who God was using. In the New Testament, in the book of Acts alone, You'll be grateful here. I shortened this list from like 40 names, uh, just, just a few. But just in the book of Acts alone, we have a long list of wealthy people who gave generously. In Acts chapter 4, we have Joseph, also called Barnabas. We have in Acts chapter 9, Dorcas. Yes, that's her name. Cornelius in Acts chapter 10, uh, Sergius in Acts chapter 13, the list goes on and on and on. And it, these are examples of wealthy people with the right heart who follow the Lord and, and, and follow God with childlike faith. So clearly God doesn't, revolve, uh, doesn't require all of us to do a vow of poverty, to sell everything you own, and to move into the mountains and, and never speak again. So these are all incomplete views that we can have rattling around in our heads that can keep us from understanding what God is actually saying here in this chapter. So let's dive into the chapter. Um, starts off by telling us that uh, Jesus is on his way to Jerusalem, so on the way to the cross, when a man ran up, fell on his knees before Jesus, and says, good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? So right off the bat, at the very first verse, we can see that this story is full of passion. He ran up. He, I mean, if you're a parent or if you've ever babysat, you know what it looks like to mope. Or you just kind of, this is opposite of this man. This man is full of excitement. He runs up to Jesus. He falls before Jesus. And then he starts off by saying, good teacher. This is the only time that the words good teacher are used. Jesus is consistently called teacher, but he's, ask, he's adding the, the word good here. So it's passion. And it shows us that this man is full of purposeful movement. He's passionate. He's full of respect and honor, submission. All this is, is meant to show us immediately that, that this man most likely has the right heart. He's about to say something that's coming. Whether or not, how many know that you can say dumb things from the right place? That's not what's happening. I mean, that that's actually is what's happening here, but he's coming from the right place. So the very first thing that, that Jesus reveals here is that this is someone who's coming with the right heart. Let's see what he says. So Jesus responds to him, and he says, Why do you call me good? No one is good except for God alone. Now, uh, the NIV translation I'm using here, it actually falls short uh, and it, it kind of misses the point here. It says uh, the original language here is not God alone, but the word that translates to one God. And it's coming directly from Deuteronomy chapter 6, the Shema, where it says the Lord our God, the Lord is one. So Jesus is saying, hmm, why do you call me good teacher? It sounds like you're saying I'm the one God from the Shema. So Jesus is inviting this man to really fully consider what it is that he's saying. He's saying, you are connecting me 
to the God who always was. And then verse 19, Jesus quotes from the Ten Commandments. Verse 20, the man replies, after Jesus says, do these things, verse 20, the man replies, teacher, all of these I have kept since I was a young boy. Now this is where we start to see that the man is saying dumb things from the right heart. Starts off with the right heart, mm, he's, he's turning sideways a little bit here. Uh, last Sunday, I was out in the foyer, and I was talking with a little toddler, and uh, I love this conversation because this, this kid kept saying things like, well, you know, when I was a kid, I used to blah, blah, blah. <laughs> well, you know, when I was little, I used to be afraid of blah, blah, blah. And I just think there's nothing cuter than a little kid coming up telling you about, you know, now that they're so grown up, what they used to believe and do and think when they were little. You like those conversations? Uh, Mark doesn't tell us this. Uh, he doesn't tell us the, the rich man's age, but if you look at the same story in Matthew chapter 19, verse 20 tells us that this is a young man. So that, that specifically is probably locating him somewhere in his teen years. He's had his bar mitzvah, so he's at least 13, and he's not just a man, he's a young man. So this is a teenager coming to Jesus, and he says, all of this stuff's I've kept since I was a kid. It's meant to be a little ironic and a little bit humorous here, but by his own definition, he felt like he was flawless, at least since he was a kid. Verse 21, Jesus' response. Jesus looked at him, and he loved him. Isn't that an incredible response to someone who just said something dumb? Jesus looked at him, and he loved him. I don't think I would have responded that same way, would you? I would have said, listen, kid, you don't even know, you, you don't even know what you're talking about. Or I would have said, oh, you think you're perfect, huh? And I would have started trying to figure out how this kid wasn't perfect. But, but Jesus, he sees this man's intentions and responds to this man with respect and Christ-like humility. We see humbleness in this response. Jesus looked at him and loved him. He says, one thing you lack, he said. Go and sell everything you have and give it to the poor, and you will have your treasure in heaven. Then come and follow me. Now, now this passage here, th this verse, is a direct link to what Jesus had just said in a previous paragraph. So uh, we preached this. Pastor Jason, pre Pastor Jason preached this at Dia del Nino. It's where the kids come to Jesus, and Jesus says, let the little, come, little kids come to me. And then now, Jesus is, is trying to tie what he's saying back to what he just said. He says, go sell everything, give it to the poor, then you'll have your treasure in heaven. So he's tying it back to when he said, truly I tell you, anyone who does not receive the kingdom like a little child will never enter it. Only Christ-like dependence on God enters the kingdom. Let's see, Jesus says, Let, let's see if you have that type of childlike faith. And in this man's case, the only way to find out if he has childlike faith is to say, give it all away. Give it all away, and let's see if you can follow me like a child. Go sell everything you have and give it to the poor, then follow me. Verse 22, at this the man's face fell. Isn't that a great description of someone who's really sad? At this a man's face fell, he went away sad because he had great wealth. Now, this is meant to be especially sad because it's, it stands up against the love that Jesus had for him. He says something stupid and Jesus looked at him and loved him and then this man doesn't return the love. I can remember... Um, when Casey and I were dating, we were in, in college. And I can remember the moment where I thought, I, I need to tell her I love her. It's, it's that moment, you know, like we're, we're serious. I need to take things to the next level. And so I can remember being in the car uh, outside of chapel, and she was talking, and I heard zero of what she was saying because all I could think of is, like, how am I going to do it? How am I going to say it? How am I going to profess my love for her? And I was terrified. Why was I terrified? 
yeah, what if she doesn't love me back? That, that's what makes this so, so harsh here, is that Jesus has just professed his love. He says, he looked at him, and I, I love this man. And then the man doesn't love him back. Verse 23, and Jesus looked around and said to his disciples. So the man leaves. Now it's just the disciples. He turns to them. This is a conversation between Jesus and, and the, the church. Jesus and his followers. Jesus and his people. This is not like, you know, people that are just surrounding him, kind of eavesdropping. This is him turning to his family. And he says, how hard it is for, a rich, for the rich to enter the kingdom of God. The disciples were amazed at his words, but Jesus said again, children, how hard it is to enter the kingdom of God. Now, Jesus is contrasting God dependence of a child with the self-reliance of the rich. He, he's, he's trying to put these things together to say there's a big difference between a childlike dependent, dependency on God and the self-reliance of a self-made person. A self-reliance of someone who has things that they can depend on. I, I've said this before but Ben is, is filled with what I would call the worst kind of lost. And it's, it's the rich man sort of lost. To where we have enough that self-reliance works. Self-reliance can keep us from God dependency. Verse 24, the disciples were amazed. It, it, this is another translation issue. It makes it sound like the disciples thought, this is so cool. I mean, this is, this is so cool. Look what Jesus is doing. But the word amazed there, it, it actually means perplexed. They, they, it's not like this is so cool. They, they're watching this whole thing happen. They're listening to Jesus, and they are totally confused. They are totally confused, even though they had a front row seat to Jesus himself. Even though they have studied God's word and learned from Jesus himself. Even though they've seen the miracles firsthand. Even though they've participated in the miracles and they're still completely confused. I want to let you know, if you're confused, you're doing all right. I mean, these, these front row seats with Jesus. And, they're, and they still don't get it. There, there's, this, there's this comfort I find here that says, like, as a Christian, if they didn't get it and they're seeing it and they're hearing it and they're walking with Jesus and they're still confused, it makes me feel a little bit better about the times where I'm like, I don't get this, but here we go, faith, a step of faith, a step of faith. If following God didn't require faith, it wouldn't be following God. If, if you understood everything you needed to understand from God, who would he be? So Christian life requires faith, and, and you should feel okay when there's doubt. You should feel okay when you don't understand, because the disciples didn't. That's not the end of the story. Please, please don't let doubt be the end of your story. So the disciples are perplexed in verse 24 at Jesus' words, but Jesus said again, children, how hard it is to enter the kingdom of God. Now, you've got to remember that in the previous passage, Jesus told them that only children enter the kingdom of God. Remember that? And now he's calling them children. This is, this is quite the compliment. This is really good news for them because as Jesus is explaining the difference between this self-reliant person who went away sad and them, he's like, you are children. You get it by not getting it. Then Jesus continues. <clears throat> it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for someone who is rich to enter the kingdom of God. 
The disciples were even more amazed, and they said to each other, Who then can be saved? Jesus looked up at them and said, With man this is impossible, but with God all things are possible. Which, I mean, some of you just need to write that on your mirror and stick it on your mirror in the morning. With God, all things are possible. I think about the things that we face in our life that seem like sticking a camel through an eye of a needle and we're like, this is impossible. And you say, no, no, with God, all things are possible. That, that phrase, the camel through the eye of the needle, was borrowed from the Babylonians who used to say, it's harder than an elephant through the eye of a needle. That's even harder. But it, it means the same thing. Now, now for I have to admit that for, for quite a while, the pastors I was uh, raised under were, were telling me that um, the eye of a needle was a small gate that camels had to crawl through, um, but that has been proven to be false over, over time. Almost every commentary you read will mention. But a lot of people say this, that is not true. Um, and I had the chance to learn that firsthand. So I have a picture of my wife and I with my brother and sister-in-law. And what is uh, the oldest functioning city on earth? This is in Morocco. It's called the Medina, and they say it's the oldest functioning city on earth. And my brother was talking about this story, and he says, do you want to see the eye of the needle? And he was being sarcastic, of course. And then he took us here. He's like, here's the gates to the Medina. And he went on to teach us uh, about how uh, people used to say that the gates were really small and the camel would have to get on its knee to kind of crawl through. And he's like, you think a camel could fit through that? <laughs> I'm like, yeah. So clearly, the eye of a needle is not a gate. Jesus is actually referring to something that seems impossible. An actual camel in an eye of a needle. So Jesus is being intentionally ludicrous when he says this point, and he says it's really hard, not impossible, because he said all things are possible, right? It's really hard for a rich man to enter, enter the kingdom, and then he says, just like putting a camel through the eye of the needle, which thoroughly confuses the disciples, the disciples were even more perplexed, even more confused. And so their, their natural question is, who then can be saved? This is ridiculous. And then Jesus is, is making sure that, that they understand that it is impossible apart from him. So th what's interesting is that this should not have been confusing to the disciples because just 11 verses ago, Jesus told them, it is so easy to go to heaven, a kid could do it. And then 11 verses later, they're like, it's impossible. Who, who can be saved? This is ridiculous. This is totally impossible. And so, and so it makes you kind of wonder, what happened? What happened between 11 verses ago and, and now? Well, what happened is that they got pretty impressed by someone, didn't they? You can imagine the disciples who are following Jesus and, and constantly in need of miracles because there's no one brought lunch and again and we've got to feed everybody. There's no one planning. There's no administrative person on this whole Jesus team. You can imagine them saying, you know what would be nice? <clears throat> maybe someone young who could run the town. You know what would be nice is maybe someone who had a little bit of money so that we can swing by McDonald's and pick up food for everybody. So, so what happens between 11 verses ago when Jesus says, you can go to heaven, you just have to have childlike faith. And right now, where they're totally confused is that an impressive person walked into their life. This man was young, he was wealthy, he seems earnest. Have you ever been wooed by an impressive person before? By the things that you hoped that they would bring into your life? and they, they didn't quite turn out to be all that they had said. For the disciples, maybe they're thinking, I, we don't know this, but you can imagine some side conversations where they're talking about, like, who else should we add to the team? And then that man walks into their life, and they're saying, ding, 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 that's what we're looking for. 
He's young, he's wealthy, he's humble, he's earnest, he's wealthy, he's nice, he's wealthy. And then Jesus sends the man away, and they're thinking, what on earth? Who could be saved then? If that man can't make it, none of us can make it. And Jesus looks at them and says, children, you're making it. Jesus looked at them and said, with man, it is impossible. But with God, all things are possible. The tension between wealth and discipleship is real, and it can't be ignored. But I want to show you an encouraging video of, of proof that wealthy can also be pleasing to God. Wealthy people can follow Jesus with childlike abandonment. I'm going to show you a video after I tell you a little bit of the context. This is my friend's church in Las Vegas. Yes, Las Vegas has churches. <laughs> uh, he, he pastors the Las Vegas Church of the Nazarene, and his church has been in financial crisis really since COVID. Uh, there's been people who, a lot of deaths in the church. It was a very old church. Uh, and there's been people who have been moving out of state, people who have left the church. Uh, increasing utility costs. Anyone understand that one? Amen. <laughs> uh, skyrocketing insurance rate. And on top of this, on top of all these financial woes, they are $650,000 in debt to their facility. So what happened was the board has been, the, their board has been trying to decide how to move forward, and they, they took a vote to cannibalize the property. What that means is like when you have a church like ours that has acres, sometimes you sell acres in order to prolong ministry a little bit. So they took the vote. It was affirmative. They got um, permission from the district to proceed, and that's where the story picks up in this video. God showed up and provided for us in only a way 
that God can. God spoke to what we now know are individuals and prompted them to pay off our debt. And those individuals responded out of obedience to the prompting of the Holy Spirit. And now our story in this particular moment of our history is Las Vegas Church of Nazarene. And for well into the future, it changed. We are completely debt free of the church. Isn't that amazing? That's, that's not a small thing. That, that's, that's a big deal. I, I needed to watch it. it just, that was, uh, I believe, last Sunday's sermon, and he, um, he sent it to me, and I, I watched the whole sermon, and man, I tell you, I needed it. You know why? Because over the past couple of months, our, our church is like $12,000 short, and I, I needed that to sound like chump chains. And to, to be able to, my, God knows my faith is so small. I'm, I'm looking at this going, what are we going to do? What are we, you know, and, and the answer to what we do is we trust God. We, we continue taking steps of obedience towards him. And then the Lord uh, sent that video to remind me, you'll be obedient. You'll be faithful. And I'll provide I, I, I thank God for wealthy people with childlike faith. Isn't that amazing? Verse 28, Peter does what he does. Ugh, this guy. Peter spoke up. Of course he did. We left everything to follow you. This is, this is actually mostly true. So Peter speaks up. He's like, God, we, Jesus, we have left Everything we've sacrificed, I've given and I've given and I've given, and there's almost nothing left to give. And, and we've, we've done it all for you. And I just want to say, because Jesus didn't say it, that's actually not totally true. Uh, Peter and Andrew still have homes, and according to John 21, they probably still have their boats. I would love a boat like they're doing all right. So Jesus, you know, I wish Jesus would have been like, wham, wham, almost, <laughs> but he doesn't, he doesn't. Because Jesus doesn't argue the details of what's going on. Jesus sees the heart of Peter's claim and he says, truly I tell you, Jesus replied, no one who has left home or brothers or sisters or mothers or fathers or children or fields for me and for the gospel will fail to receive 100 times as much in this present age. Homes, brothers, sisters, mothers, children, fields, along with persecutions in the age to come. But many who are first will be last, and the last will be first. So, so Jesus makes a wild claim here that I don't think any of us are totally comfortable with, but here's the claim, is that everything that they have abandoned to follow Jesus in this present age will be replaced 100 times. Now, wait a minute, Pastor, that sounds like the, that's, that smells like the prosperity gospel. That can't be right. Well, let me, I'll just respond with two things here. Uh, first of all, Jesus said it, not me. This is Jesus. <laughs> so, I mean, I guess take it up with him. Uh, second of all, I think a detailed study shows us uh, of what he's saying. It shows us that it's really not prosperity gospel at all. If you remember a couple weeks ago, or just last week, we talked about how the society that they're part of was a patriarchal society, which meant that the oldest living male was responsible for everything. And if you look at those two lists that Jesus says, the first list have seven, the second list has seven, but the father has been replaced with persecution. So, so if, you, if you look at that list... Jesus says everything will be replaced 100 times except for the Father. Because when you've been adopted into God's family, God is now your Father. He is the patriarch of our family. It's not a pastor. It's not a board member. It's not your dad. God is the patriarch of our family, and he's responsible to provide for all of your needs according to his riches in glory, Philippians 4, 19. 
Isn't that a cool thing to be adopted in the family and God steps in to assume the responsibility of all provision? When you look at the scripture that way, you realize that the hundred times provision, it doesn't even scratch the surface with following God as your father. You, you, you Ask me about mangoes. Ask me about fish. Ask me about feeding the homeless or, or finding rent for a year or flights to Morocco. I'll tell you, I'll tell you exactly what it's like to have the Lord provide for you a hundred times full. Obviously, though, like I, <laughs> I was kind of laughing at this because I'm a pastor. Uh, my brother and his family were missionaries, and it, it shouldn't be surprising, and it's probably not shocking to you that pastors and missionaries aren't exactly rolling in the dough. We're not, you know, we're, we're not exactly buying like rental properties and those types of things. Most of us are just trying to scratch by to make ends meet. But there's a little bit more depth here that helps us understand this hundred times full blessing. In verse 29, Jesus says, Truly I say to you, no one who has left counter with me, home, brothers, sisters, mothers, fathers, children, or fields, for me and for the gospel, will fail to receive a hundred times full in its present age. Now, this clearly isn't an exhaustive list. Jesus, you know, he could have gone on for four and a half hours to name everything on earth, but that's not what he's doing because that's not the point. He names seven things. Two out of the seven things are material. So there is a material blessing that's part of following God that he provides. He lists fields, in homes, but that means that about 72% of his blessings are really not about things, they're about family. 100% of, of this list here is communicated in communal language. This is, a, this is communicated to his people, to his disciples, to the church. So two out of seven are listed as like, yeah, God will provide for the material stuff, but 72% of this is about the, the blessings of living communally with God's family who's, who's trying to reconcile us to him and to each other. It's written to a community, about a community, about bearing each other's burdens. And then what he says is, the hundred times return in this present age happens when you're an active part of a church community and you begin to step into, to lean into that community to bear each other's burdens, whether they're spiritual or emotional or physical. When you step in, I gotta tell you, you can be part of a church and not lean into the community. So if this sounds foreign to you, or you're like, I don't know if I'd say God has blessed me with that communal sort of sharing, I would say, lean in. You know, that happens mostly through your group. Our, our group is an amazing example of this, where we deal with all kinds of junk from each other, and we do our best to, to bear each other's burdens and to, and to move forward, and if you lean into that, I think what you'll find is that you'll have a new family who will, who will be there, who will bear burdens for each other. So Jesus says there's benefits now. That's, that's the benefits now part. But there's also benefits in the age to come, which refers back to the rich man. <clears throat> and, and this is meant to, to highlight the irony of this man who didn't want to abandon his financial security as Jesus instructed in order to inherit what he desired most. This man wasn't asking about uh, blessings in this present age, was he? He had those. <clears throat> He was asking about the blessings in the age to come. And the irony is he's not willing to give up this, which Jesus would re replay a hundred times full, in order to inherit the blessings in the age to come. And then Jesus summarizes the entire chapter by repeating what he had already said in chapter 9, verse 35. The first, uh, many who will be first, who are first will be last, and the last shall be first. I'm going to invite the band to come up as we 
receive communion together. If you have your elements, will you bring these out? And uh, I'm going to ask you also to remain seated for communion. If you don't have uh, elements, would you just raise your hand so we can pass these out to you? Communion elements. Okay, up there, down here, up there. So we have several upstairs also that, that need. I'm, uh, <clears throat> I'm going to invite you to receive communion sitting, and that is actually it was brought to my attention. I appreciate this, that uh, for uh, elderly people, it's a struggle to stand up and fumble with these stupid little cups. So... We're trying to make this easier for you to focus on the Lord and let the Lord focus on your hearts as we receive communion together. Philippians 2, verses 7 through 8, tell us that Jesus made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant and being made in human likeness and being found in obedience, in appearance of, as a, of a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on the cross. This passage encourages us to leave it all behind for Jesus. And Philippians tells us that's exactly what Jesus did for us. That, that is like a baby step to reflecting back to God that you are grateful and that you, are lo- that you love him. So I'm going to invite you to close your eyes and, and reflect for a moment. In communion, we, we remember Jesus' sacrifice, that he gave it all for us. He held nothing back. And in communion this morning, I want to ask you for your obedience to do the same for God. Salvation is free, but discipleship, as we see, it costs everything. So with your heads bowed, I want you to imagine yourself standing in front of a warehouse. And the warehouse is filled with everything you could ever want in your entire life. That could be cars, homes, family, jobs, success, fame, fortune, respect, whatever. Fill that warehouse with everything you ever wanted in your whole life. you a question. Are you willing to leave it all to follow Jesus? And what we see from the scripture is that what God requires, what discipleship requires, what following Jesus requires is a wholehearted, unreserved commitment to Jesus. And before we receive communion together, I just want to give you a chance to respond to whatever the Holy Spirit is saying to you. If you're here today and and you don't have a relationship with Jesus Christ as your personal Savior, which means you've repented from your ways and you've decided that you today are willing to turn from what you want and to go God's way towards what He wants, Would you raise your hand so I can pray for you? Good, thank you, good. Thank you. The Bible tells us when one person turns toward Jesus, that heaven has a party, and this morning three have. But there's a question for the rest of you today. And that question is, are you willing to leave it all 
to follow Jesus. I'm going to leave that one between you and God. And just ask for you to be obedient. The bread that we have represents the body of Christ that was broken, beaten for us so that our sins can be forgiven. This is the body of Christ that was broken for you and I. Together, let's receive the body and be grateful. The juice represents the blood of Christ that was shared for the forgiveness of our sins, making a way for us to be made right with God. Let's remember the blood of Christ and be thankful together. Let's receive together. Would you stand with me as we pray? Yeah, at the very beginning when I was talking about that song and praying for our kids and making a tie to the sermon, the tie is we have to be willing to leave it all. Our kids, our grandkids, our nephews, our nieces, those around us, the younger generations, they need to see what it looks like for people to hold nothing back to follow Jesus. And so I've asked the band um, to close in a song that says it all. It just says, I trust in God. So would you sing this? Yeah.